Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Ivana, and I want to thank all of our listeners and viewers for tuning in and joining us for another episode. Today, I am joined by ICR research scientist and zoologist, Dr. Frank Sherwin. Good to be here this morning. Good. How are you today? Yeah feeling good. Good. Well, I'm so glad to have you here. And today I wanted to talk to you about a particular feature that we know some animals display and one that we as humans maybe try to mimic as the need arises. Uh, Like, let's say you're at a family gathering that maybe you don't want to be at. And of course, what I'm referring to is camouflage. You bet. Camouflage is also known as cryptic coloration. It's an ability for creatures to use disguising their appearance so they can blend in with Mm -hmm. their environment and perhaps uh, avoid being a hot lunch for some (laughs) other creature. That's probably something that comes in handy. (laughs) Um, I know that a lot of us have heard about camouflage. Maybe we only are familiar with it as a fashion statement, but it goes a lot deeper in the animal kingdom. And you mentioned some of that could be for protection, Um, but could you go a little bit further? Are there different kinds of camouflage? There are indeed. There's a whole different facet of of camouflage out there that is unbelievably complex. And a variety of animals, both in the ocean, out of the ocean, uh, are found to exhibit these kinds of camouflage ability. For example, in the ocean, there's something called silvering like the color silver. Silvering, uh, it's camouflaged by reflection, the silver reflection. And most fish in the upper ocean uh, exhibit silvering, such as herring and sardines. And they have this reflective capability that actually helps them to blend in with the environment. Also, there's something called motion dazzle. That's a type... (laughs) Of, Fun. of uh, yeah, camouflage. And so they call it motion dazzling. I don't have time to get into it, mm-hmm. but there's also uh, a camouflage that is involved with resemblance to the surroundings. That's probably some of the most common camoufla- uh, camouflage techniques mm-hmm. that we're aware of. Uh, something that is also used by man as well as animals is the elimination of shadows. And so in World War II in particular, they tried to eliminate shadows and aircraft would not be able to see some of these terrestrial uh, vehicles. Also something called ultra blackness, not just black, but ultra blackness. And Mm -hmm. we have some species of deep sea fish that have black skin that absolutely blend in with their environment. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these deep sea fish have uh, a, a chemical ability to make light and they have it hanging off of their forehead, Mm -hmm. and that brings innocent fish in to become a hot lunch. Mm -hmm. But that's called ultra-blackness. Some other kind of camouflage is called distraction. That's a technique. And self-decoration. I like the self-decoration because crabs, uh, uh, certain species of crabs, will take sponges from on the Mm seafloor, and with their arm, they will put the sponges on their carapace, on their back. And the crab then becomes uh, a walking sponge, basically. Mm -hmm. And then the predators would not be able to recognize it at all. And so that's called self-decoration. There's also a type of camouflage called transparency. And this is uh, some of the members of the um, jellyfish family. Mm -hmm. And so jellyfish are transparent, basically. And we all know the jellyfish are about 94 percent water. And so in the open ocean, they're transparent and obviously predators would not be able to see them. Interestingly, one of the favorite foods of the sea turtle are jellyfish. Uh, Countershading is a type of of, uh, camouflage. Countershading, again, that gets into a little bit of of detail there, but gazelles on the African Serengeti engage in countershading as well as sharks. Sharks, as you look at the way their color scheme is, that's called countershading. But one of my favorites Mm -hmm. is something called changeable skin coloration. Now, changeable skin coloration is found, for example, with the firefly squid and also with the octopus, Mm -hmm. one of my favorite creatures as a zoologist. Now, the changeable skin coloration has to do do with special structures in the skin called chromatophores. These chromatophores are 
unbelievably complex. They're small, but they're innervated by the nervous system of the octopus. There's also some muscles attached to the chromatophore and also a sac of pigment. And so when they, the, uh, for example, the octopus wants to it blend in with the environment, it can do so within just a fraction of a second. And it all has to do with the nervous impulse from the brains of the octopus. The octopus has more than one brain. I didn't and, know that. Yeah, it sends an impulse mm -hmm. down to the chromatophores, causing the muscle fibers to uh, constrict or in such a way that it opens up this bag of of pigment and we can see videos for example on YouTube mm -hmm. of how quickly the octopus can blend in quite literally with its environment you can't even see it so again that's called changeable skin coloration there's also something called counter illumination some squids for example the Hawaiian bobtail squid uh, has this counter illumination where it has packets of bacteria, specific bacteria that are able to be bioluminescent. Mm -hmm. So this packet of bacteria in the uh, Hawaiian bobtail squid is set up in such a way that the bacteria exhibit a lumino luminosity or illumination, which then helps to break up the silhouette of the squid from creatures that are below the Hawaiian bobtail squid. As they look up, the Hawaiian bobtail squid would otherwise be silhouetted, but it isn't because it has this packet of bioluminescent bacteria, which breaks up its outline, and it's very, very effective in evading the predators that are found below the squid. So that's called counter-illumination. And another is called cryptic behavior. And cryptic behavior is a very favorite of mine because it has to do with the leafy sea dragon. The leafy sea dragon it actually looks like uh, uh, some vegetation hmm. in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And the leafy sea dragon is designed by the creator to make motions just like you would see with uh, leaf-like mm -hmm. material in the ocean there. So it's very, very difficult to see this leafy sea dragon because it blends in so perfectly with the environment. Wow, that's amazing. And you've listed over, what, maybe about 10 different forms of camouflage, and that's, I mean, that's amazing to me, the, the variety yeah. of the ways that this could be used or applied. Um, and also interesting that it's sometimes used for defense, you know, protection. Um, but then also you've mentioned some that will use it in order to find prey, like the the fish with the, you know, I think of the angler fish, anyone who watches right. Finding Nemo, you know, yeah. classic. But um, that's just so interesting that just rattling those off is um, incredible because, uh, again, for us, we are going to attribute all of that creativity to the Creator, to Jesus yeah. Christ. Um, so that is so interesting. And you mentioned some of your favorites. And um, as you mentioned, the octopus has its form of camouflage. Um, how how does that differ from maybe like a leopard? How, you know, we have the... Sponsor the fur, the right. It's, it's a different form of camouflage. Can you go deeper into just how those different things apply to the different um, ecosystems or places that these animals and creatures live. Exactly. And so what the Lord has done is infinite wisdom is design something like the leopard mm -hmm. or some of these other animals that I mentioned, like the gazelle, mm -hmm. and they just have the fur that has a different, it has a, a type of a blend to it. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, the spotted leopard has the spots. There's nothing you can do to change that. It really doesn't need to because a spotted leopard leopard doesn't have any real predators. It mm -hmm. preys on other animals, and so it blends in with the environment with that spotted uh, coat that it has. Now, that's vastly different from, example, for example, with the octopus. The octopus, it has these chromatophores, and it can scoot along the bottom of the ocean, and it can actually blend in with whatever it encounters. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely amazing how quickly it be done, within just a fraction of a second. Now, now, there are some uh, terrestrial animals that can do that, such as uh, some types of uh, reptiles can blend in with the environment, but it takes time. It might take several minutes mm -hmm. to, for it to blend in with the environment. And so the speed of which this is accomplished, I think, is, is just simply amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really interesting. And you mentioned the reptiles. I automatically think of um, a chameleon Correct. And, and how 
they yeah. they use that ability as well. Um, you've given us your favorites. You've given us a lot of different information about the variety of these. Um, can you give us more information about how, when we think of secular science and we can observe all these different kinds of creatures and their abilities to use camouflage. Now, secular science would say in, in some form that these abilities evolved over time. Do you know what they would use to explain that, what that actual argument is? Well, basically, when I read the literature, I see that the, the secular scientists who don't believe in creation, who don't believe in God, that believe that everything can be explained by what we call a naturalistic philosophy, they would simply say that this is an ability that the creature evolved. Well, it evolved is not an explanation at all. It's simply a title that they give for this ability to undergo camouflage. Mm -hmm. But we, on the other hand, would look at the irreducible complexity. For example, again, my favorite would be the chromatophores in the octopus and say time, chance, and natural selection, whatever that is, has no way of explaining how you could get this this incredible ability of the octopus to blend in so quickly with its environment. And that's also true with the uh, chameleon as well. Chameleon's a little bit different uh, process there where it, it uses its um, uh, basically hormones and all to accomplish mm -hmm. that task. And so we would give credit where credit is due. We give glory to the Creator, the mm -hmm. Lord Jesus Christ, who designed all of these techniques that I went over just thousands of years ago. And with mentioning the chameleon, you talked about hormones being a trigger. You mentioned the octopus. It's more of a connection with their brains, plural. We've learned that. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain maybe just a few of the other examples, not all of them, but just a few of the other examples? What are the triggers for the camouflage effect in them, or is it just their skin is made that way? If you just talk about a couple of those examples. Yeah, it's uh, basically, it can be found, the camouflage ability can be found within the individual, like the octopus, the chameleon, all that, or it can be on the surface of the individual, as we talked about with mm -hmm. the fur, and for example, the spotted uh, a, a nature of, of these uh, terrestrial animals. And of course, also with what I'd mentioned there when it came to the uh, silvering that mm -hmm. we can have, this silver color that helps it to reflect and, and therefore blend in with mm -hmm. uh, the environment. So it's both within and without the creature. Right. And it all depends on their environment and the ecosystem of which they uh, inhabit. But it, again, it, it shouts, I think, creation very clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm impressed because I knew of certain forms of camouflage, but as you are listing them back to back, it, it really is blowing my mind. There's something else that's really quite amazing that we, was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2014. This is just amazing. <laughs> it, an article where a team of scientists tried to mimic the octopus skin that we were just talking about mm -hmm. with the chromatophores and all. And so that's quite an effort to be made in even 21st century zoologists. So they tried to mimic the octopus skin. They listed 76 distinct steps required to fabricate their photo detector array. Wow. Now it's called a, a photo detector array. You can imagine the sophistication there. And 74 steps to fabricate, fabricate what they call the diode array. So we have the photo detector array and the diode array done by these scientists just back in 2014. But, and here's the key, they still didn't come close to the camouflage ability of the octopus. Now, with these 76 steps and the 74 steps that I just mentioned, each step had to be exact. If one step broke down, then the whole process was of none effect. Mm -hmm. This led one researcher to say, and I quote, as an engineer looking at movies of squid, octopus, and cuttlefish, you just realize you're not going to get close to that level of sophistication. And I heartily agree. God got it right the first time. Mm -hmm. He has done such an amazing job to produce the kinds of techniques that we see when it comes to camouflage. No matter what kind of camouflage we've been discussing, it all points back to creative design and organization of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give him the glory and the honor. Mm -hmm. Amen. I agree with that. And that's 150 steps, and they still couldn't even 
succeed. Um, so that's that's intense engineering, as they mentioned. And I think it's probably easier for Christians to look at this evidence and say, oh, okay, I see how that relates to a creator design, all of that. Um, but for Christians, could you explain did or what would be the best, your best explanation of camouflage and its purpose before the fall? Yeah, that's always kind of a difficult know, question we're, to, we're to try and think what were conditions like before the fall, mm -hmm. because we have been so exposed to the post-fall uh, world and environment around us. It's hard to, to take a step back and say, how about it? What was it like before the fall? So we, I, for example, would say, yeah, leopards still had its spots before the fall. And there are other, yeah, we'd have to take it by a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure if we'll ever come down to a real cogent explanation for all of this. However, on the positive side, we are the Institute for Creation research. So we're still researching this. We can hypothesize. The evolutionary mm -hmm. community hypothesizes. So, hey, turn around is fair play. We can <laughs> hypothesize as well. They have their theories. We have our theories. But we start with one who was there in the beginning, who was there and he created all the plants and the animals that we see just thousands of years ago. And we're amazed at the sophistication and the detail that natural science sim simply cannot begin to explain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. I find that so interesting. Thanks for taking a stab at that question. I know we can only speculate and, and mm -hmm. think about what those possibilities were. We can't fully know the answers. Um, but we can appreciate still what God has done and what we see in his creation. So thank you for being here today, Dr. Sherwin. And of course, to all of our listeners and viewers, we appreciate you joining us again for another episode. Stay tuned for more episodes. You can find this podcast on YouTube or wherever you find your podcasts. And of course, my name is Ivana, and we'll see you next time on The Creation Podcast.